This is Cadillac Unscripted on 107.9 CDY. Katie Huckle has the week off. This is sponsored by Independent Bank, and this is a show that I have been wanting to do for a very, very long time. Now, most folks know that um, one of my other jobs is a paraprofessional in the uh, digital media production classroom at the Wexford Masaki Career Tech Center, and this is actually the first time that I get to interview one of my former students. I knew you as Cassie Potter, but uh, you're Cassie Faust now because you're a married lady. Yes. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. I'm good. How are you? I, I am great. And, the, you know, the reason why I wanted to have you on, Cassie, is because in the seven and a half years, six and a half years since you left the classroom because you graduated in 2016, you've lived enough, lived enough to have several lifetimes. You seriously have. And I got to tell you the story. So while you were uh, in our classroom, you were one of a few students who were on a rotation. You did uh, you worked at 9 and 10 News for a little while kind of got to uh, the ins and outs of the operations department and uh, you graduated and uh, I happened to be out at nine and 10 one day and uh, I was running graphics for a newscast and appearing on the screen in a mugshot is my former student. And you're, you're, you're giggling about this right now because <laughs> yeah. you're, you are recovering. Uh, but, and, and you were Cassie, one of my favorite students, you truly were. And uh, my heart sank and I knew there was a story. And several years have passed since that day. So this is kind of a story of redemption. It's a, re it's a story of, um, of you rising up from the ashes, um, rebuilding your life, and you're already crying. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> so why don't you take me on a timeline from the last time that I saw you in the digital media production classroom to where we are today? There's a lot to tell. Yes, there's a lot. Okay, so I graduated high school and I was living with my parents. Mm -hmm. I um, turned 18. I moved out into the first place that I lived outside of my parents' house with my boyfriend. And then Things were rough. We were always fighting. I'm going to stop you right there. As an 18-year-old, were you one of those teenagers that said, the moment I'm graduated, I'm getting the heck out of Dodge? Is that what you were thinking? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. And yes. a lot a lot of 18-year-olds, as soon as they graduate, that's what they think. I got to get yeah. out of here. People, my yeah. parents are cramping my style. I got to I gotta find something. So anyway, yes, go ahead. Yes, I, I just wanted to be out on my own uh -huh. and figure life out and... Mm -hmm. It has been a journey so far. <laughs> yeah, it, it certainly has. So, um, so you moved out, uh, and and so take take me to the first couple of years after after you graduated high school. Um, I was on and off with the boyfriend that I had at that time, and I would move back into my parents' house, back into living with him, and then back to my parents' house every time we broke up. We broke up like four times before it was over with. I was working at McDonald's and delivering pizza at BC Pizza. I was going to frat parties and I was just, usually I was a designated driver, so I wasn't drinking that much, but it was, I was just having a fun time. And then um, we had broke up that last time and then I met the guy who I'm married to now. He, um, is that quite a bit older than me and my parents did not approve. So I got kicked out and then I was forced to move in with him while living with him and stuff. Everything was good until we got into hard drugs mm -hmm. and it wasn't like he pushed them on me or anything. We did them together, mm -hmm. tried them both for the first time together. So it wasn't like that. And it's once you once you try meth for like that first time if you don't if you don't have control then it's all downhill from there cuz i th i told myself it was going to be just a weekend thing just a couple day thing and then i was working at an afc home at that time those two did not mix at all mm -hmm. i was working at an afc home and i had to go back to work after those that first 3 day binge I was tired, I was hungry, because you don't eat or don't sleep, and I was just exhausted. I went back to work, 
And I worked for the week, and then, again, I had a couple days off, so I just said, let's do it again. And then I did that for a couple weeks, and then by, like, the third or fourth weekend of doing that, it turned into a week long, and I didn't even realize that it was that long that I was doing it. It turned into from two days to a whole seven days of doing it, and I was like, I didn't even notice until I was at work, I was cooking my resident's food. And I was like, this smells really good. And I was like, when is the last time I ate? And, and you, I was you didn't, literally didn't realize. Yeah. Wow. And I was thinking back, I was like, I didn't eat yesterday. Like, and then I was like, I wonder if I lost any weight. So after I'm done cooking, I go and jump on the scale. I lost 10 pounds like that. Mm-hmm. And I was like, cha-ching, the way to lose weight. <laughs> Not the way, not no, the way to lose <laughs> no, it's not. It's <laughs> not. Um, and then, you know, uh, I wasn't just doing it. I was after like a little bit. I lost my job because I was always calling in. I was always late because that's just what drugs do to you. You don't want to do anything mm-hmm. but drugs. <laughs> exactly. And um, I lost my job. So then got to find another income. So we started dealing and then, um, that didn't last very long. Uh, doing drugs and dealing them is, is not something like you can do together cause you will get caught up real quick. And I, and I want to say to, for, for clarification, you, you, you are completely free from probation. You are, yep. you're, you're free to live your life the way yes. you want to. You're not, you're not under, under any, any supervision or anything like that at this point in your no. life. So, but then, so you got caught. Yeah. Okay. How, what, what happened? Um, well, it's my boyfriend, he was on parole and, um, some girl that we really trusted, we let in and the first chance she got, she went and told on us because she dropped dirty for her probation officer. So, Um, our house got raided. They came in, took my boyfriend to jail, went through all of our stuff, um, ransacked my room. My clothes were out of my dressers, my nightstands everywhere. Um, my vanity with all my makeup and everything, everything was just strewed all over the room. And, um, I went to jail for two days until I got bonded out and, when I got arrested, I didn't know what to do. Like, I've never been in trouble before in my life. I've, like, the worst I've done is get, like, in trouble for not doing my homework. <laughs> like, I've or, never. Or, or, or in the classroom, Cassie, can you put your phone away, please? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, Cassie, can you stop talking? <laughs> right. Yeah. So this is, this is a, a whole new severe thing yeah. for you. Yeah. I was scared, mm-hmm. and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if I should tell them the truth, if I should lie. <sighs> lie until my face turned blue. I didn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I was just frantic at that time because I'd been up for five days. I'd been using and it was nighttime. It was summertime. I was just in shorts and like this t-shirt and I was in the detective's van. They were talking to me and they, they have more than one person to ask you what happened and, um, if you have drugs and all that, because they want to catch you up in a lie. They want to make sure that your answers are consistent. Exactly. So I was like telling these people and I'm like, I don't, I don't want to talk to you again. Like I've already said what I had to say. Mm -hmm. And I was just bawling. I didn't know what to do. I I was anxious and they didn't even put me in handcuffs because I was like so frantic. They weren't scared that I was going to run away. (laughs) Like, um, so then I went to jail. And at that point, they probably didn't know you had no prior criminal record, right? No. no they probably, probably looked not. at your face and said, We trust this girl. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So then um, I was in there. N- don't remember anybody's phone number. I don't know who to call. It was three o'clock in the morning by the time I got booked in and I was able to make a phone call. The only person that I could remember their number was my poor grandma <laughs> getting a call from me from jail at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and what does that do to, I mean, from an emotional standpoint? What does that do to you? 
I mean, I can I can see right now, mm-hmm. in in recalling this, this this is this is hard for you. Yeah, well, it's um, it was my grandma who passed away from cancer mm-hmm. that I had to call, mm-hmm. and she didn't live too many years after that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's kind of rough, and it kind of it's hard sometimes because I feel like I've let her down. And I try not to beat myself up about it because sometimes I think if you weren't doing those drugs and you weren't uh, away from your family, you could have had more time. Mm-hmm. But you can't go back. And the best thing you can do for your family is recover exactly. and, and just do better. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the it's it's interesting when you get into a when you get into a a, a a uh, a rough patch like you do the first person that you phone that you send a, a phone call to is the one that you believe is going to care the most and probably is going to be the one who is going to be the 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 least harsh on you right oh no this my grandma she was she told you what she thought and she did <laughs> not care <laughs> sounds like my own mother anyway yeah, yeah she did not care um so so that fo- so that phone call is placed <laughs> yep, and I ask her, well, I try not to give her the details because I know she's going to be mad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm in jail. I just need my dad's number. She's like, what are you in jail for? And I'm like, Grandma, not right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. So, yeah, and then I have to tell her, and then she's like, all right, well, gave him my dad's number. And I'm assuming she probably went back to bed after that because <laughs> it was 3 a.m. But um, I call my dad I think I don't remember if I called him right after that or if I called him the next day and then um he calls my other grandma and I fill out the paper for a court court appointed attorney because I was like I know I don't have money for that I know my family don't have money for that so I'm gonna have to get a court appointed one well then I didn't think I was getting out of there either I did not think that I was gonna be able to get bonded out because again I'm not somebody who comes from a bunch of money. Right. And this it is doesn't a, this just is have a it. First time experience for you, so you don't know probably really how the system works. Yeah. Yeah. So and then somebody told me about a bondsman and everything, and I was like, Well, maybe, just maybe. So my dad got uh connected to the bondsman and they came get they came and got me two days after. So I was there for two days. Um then after that, I found out that they, my grandma actually got the money for a um, actual lawyer. And um, he, he's actually right here in Cadillac. And he did a really good job with my case and everything. He got it from seven charges to one. And then um, I was able to get the Haida closer to the microphone there you go okay yeah so um i got out and then my dad immediately made me go get all my stuff and move back in with him as a parent i probably would have done the same thing yeah i I mean (laughs) whether my kid liked it or not i probably would have done the same thing it's like i gotta keep an eye on you kiddo yeah, that's exactly what he did, too. Okay. He's like, you you don't have an option. So mm-hmm. I loaded up as much stuff as I could into my dad's truck, and then he drove me. Now, I lived in Benzie at this time. Mm-hmm. So he drove from Benzie County Jail to back in Leroy, where I grew up as a kid and everything. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm there, and then um, I get put on bond and I'm not allowed to have contact with my boyfriend. I'm not allowed to get in any trouble at all. So I was on a very tight leash with my dad and I stayed home and I went to the library and that's all. And a couple of days later I had to go back to drug test because I had to drug test Mondays and Fridays at like 6 a.m. And um, when I was first arrested, they didn't drug test me at all. Like I thought usually when, you get arrested for drugs or something, then they're going to drug test you. No, they didn't tr- drug test me at all. So I went back and I took a drug test and there were still drugs in my system because I was using them 
every single day, every single night for months. And they, and it hadn't gotten out of your system. Yet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, I failed a little bit and they put me right back in jail and I thought that they were going to revoke my bond. They tried to, but I explained to them that I didn't do anything wrong, that it was just from before. They said, okay, well, pass the drug test then you can go home. So I was in there for another three days. They finally gave me a drug test and I was able to go home. And then living with my parents, I got a job and I was doing my drug test. I was doing everything I was supposed to do. Um, and then it came to like a couple months later in December, I got, I got arrested originally in September. Um, actually six days after I turned 19, I got arrested and, um, couple months later, December 11th or 12th, um, I went in for sentencing and they had dropped it down from eight charges, seven or eight to one. And it was possession of meth. And I had to plead guilty to that. And it's the 7411. And, um, I got 90 days in jail, a hundred hours of community service and, a um, couple thousand dollars in fines. And then I was like, I really think didn't think I was going to jail that day. And I think my lawyer didn't think I was going to jail that day either. And um, yeah, I went to jail and it was, it wasn't the worst experience. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be, but You're talking about being in jail. Yeah. It's, it was very lonely Mm -hmm. and kind of boring. Um, I can probably tell you I've almost read more books sitting in jail than I have (laughs) my entire life. In the 19 years (laughs) leading up to that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and um, it wasn't too bad. There's a couple arguments. Like It wasn't as bad as uh, some things that you hear about. Um, There wasn't that many arguments, just a couple like bickering between some girls in there and there wasn't anything like severely bad that happened but it's not something you would ever want to repeat (laughs) no definitely (laughs) not it was very boring yeah it was very lonely and everything there costs way more and the food isn't that great either Mm -hmm. i mean we got cake almost every single day so that was kind of cool but (laughs) that was like the best thing about it (laughs) well you weren't losing weight anymore from drugs let's put it that way (laughs) Right. <laughs> so how long were you in jail? Um, 75 days. Okay. Because I had five days of good time, or five, five days of the um, time that I served before mm-hmm. when I got arrested. Mm-hmm. And then um, I think it was 10 days of good time. Um, like every, every so many weeks you're there, you get so many days off. Okay. So... And that's if you don't do anything wrong Mm -hmm. either. So if you were causing trouble or getting in trouble in there, um, then they could take your good time away if they feel like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Okay. So you get out. Yeah. What happens then? Um, I get out and there's this guy that I was talking to before I went to jail And I think that it's a good idea to move in with him because when you're on probation, you have to have a job. You have to have reliable transportation. You have to be able to go see your probation officer and everything and be able to have communication with them, have a phone, everything. And actually, if you don't have a job, um, I was told that they can put you in jail for not having a job or a stable place to live. And my dad didn't have a car at this time. And it just didn't seem like a good situation to get myself back up on my feet. So I moved in with him, and then we started dating. And that wasn't really the best idea because, I mean, I got clean, and I got a good job, and I was doing good for myself. But then couple I was clean for two years. I worked on an assisted living home. I was making good money, got a car loan, everything, and then... I just started to not really even 
like to be in the same room with him anymore. Like, I just, like, it, he just kind of annoyed me. Like, I knew I wasn't in love with him anymore. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know if I was in the beginning or not. Um, but. It just seemed like that was a, a way for you to be able to return to normalcy faster. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, at the beginning, on the, at the beginning, I did like him and I did want to hang out with him and we got along good and everything. And then just over time, like I wanted to be out on my own and I wanted to be able to not have to answer to anybody and not have to tell anybody anything. And we lived with his parents. Mm. So it was like, I, and I kept telling him this, like, I want to have our own place. And he didn't really seem like he was too interested in it. Mm -hmm. And he was okay with just staying there. And I wasn't. So that's one thing that started to make me like think, have different thoughts about him. Mm-hmm. And then I realized, like, I didn't, I didn't care to hug him or kiss him or anything like that, like couples do. And I didn't, that, that was not appealing to me anymore. I went to work and I played my video game at home, my PlayStation, and that's like it, you know. Not a fulfilling life. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I didn't have really many friends that I hung out with or anything, and it was just, I worked a lot. And I was just not happy with that anymore. Going backwards a little bit, after all that you had been through, did you find out at that point who your true friends were? Yeah. Did a lot of people just kind of fall yeah. off the way? and Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a few friends that I have been friends with since high school that have stuck by my side the whole time through not talking to them because I was using drugs, through me coming back up from using drugs, trying to get my life together. And then like, especially this one, she's my best friend in the world. Courtney Ingram. She is, she's the best. You've been called out Courtney. <laughs> yes. In a very good way. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and, and again, Cassie is, is, is tearing up here just thinking about you, Courtney. So that's, that's pretty awesome. That's, you know, you find out when, when you hit the skids, when things go wrong in your life through decisions that you made or just through circumstances that happen to you, that's when you find out who really cares. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then, um, I, okay. So before when, um, going backwards a little bit again, um, when me and this person just started dating, um, been out of jail for five, six months. I had actually, we, we were fighting all the time and I was just not happy. So I actually made a phone call and tried to purchase drugs again. And I, and you, you fell back into this because of the extreme unhappiness that you were, you were, you were wanting to retreat into, into the safety of yeah. drugs that you had known before. Yeah. Well, See, I, I had purchased them, but I never got them in hand. Then by the time I was able to, because I didn't want him to know, I didn't want my boyfriend to know, and I didn't want his family that I was living with to know. So I was trying to be very secretive about it, but it was it's hard when you're living right there next to them. And, you know, they know everywhere you go. They know what you do, everything. So then a couple of days later, when I was actually able to go pick them up, at that point, I didn't want them anymore. Mm -hmm. I was like, just keep it. I don't care. And then fast forward to all that, like our, our life was good and it was okay. I didn't try to do anything after that. But then I started talking to the same person again that actually I tried to buy them from before. And then... I hung out with him. Everything was fine. I didn't use, but I knew that he did. And I knew that he was high when I got there. So then it's like the back of my mind was like, I really want to. 
like, what is so bad if I do it again? Mm-hmm. So then I went back home. And you know the answer to that question now in retrospect. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And I go back home and I am really upset because I want to break up with him, but I don't know how because I know that he loves me. And he tries to show me like that he cares and all that, but I just don't want it anymore. So I'm like, how do I do this? How do I break his heart? Like it's, it was just very upsetting for me. And then finally I left and I had five days off from work and I left and I broke up with him and I was like, I just can't do this anymore. Well, I went and hung out with that guy and then I, since I was spending the night there, I used, and then that just went downhill from there. So uh, how long of a period of time went between you being clean the first time and then um, falling off the wagon, so to speak, again? Two years. Two years. I was clean for two years before I, a little bit over two years before I started using again. Okay. And I was... uh, I had five days off from work, so I just stayed with him. And he lived in an RV in the middle of the woods. Like, he was just at campgrounds or whatever. It wasn't a really good situation. So I was there for the five days. Smiling at you because (laughs) I I know that you're looking back thinking, what was I thinking, right? (laughs) Right. Yeah, go ahead. And um, it gets worse from here. So, And um, I went back to work at the adult foster care home or the um, assisted living home that I worked at. And mind you, I've been here for over a year almost, and I loved this job. This is the best job that I've ever had, I thought. And then once again, I was using, and then I had went back to hanging out with him because I didn't go back to my old boyfriend's place because I didn't want to be with him and I didn't want to talk to him or want him to try to get me to stay with him or anything like that so my mom had lived close by at that point so I would stay the night at her house and then when I was able to I would go stay with him but then when I was there I was using so um my mom lost her apartment I wasn't able to stay with her no more so the only other place that I had was this guy that had drugs. You were and so you were in a position where the only people that you could rely on were people that didn't have your best interests at heart. Right. That's hard. And also he lived over an hour away from my job. So <laughs> I'd have to leave my job, go there. And it was the middle of winter. Um And we lived in an RV, and he worked. I eventually quit my job um, because I every single day for a month straight, I was late. If it wasn't one minute, 20 minutes, half hour, because that's just how it is. Like, I have never met a functioning addict. Mm -hmm. Like, when, I mean, there is functioning, but at the same point, like, you're always late. You're always paranoid you're always like what if this person knows and it they're like these two people are talking about me at work or like you know you just think everyone's out to get you Mm -hmm. and um really like that's not what's happening but because you're so paranoid that's what your brain is telling you. yeah and um yeah eventually i quit they told me if you do not um show up on time you will pretty much be fired because I was late for every single day for a month straight Mm -hmm. and I was like well I was running late again I was like well might as well not even go because I'm just gonna get fired so um at that point um we were living together in his RV he was working he was also doing things behind my back talking to his ex like he was just a very shady person and I didn't see it at that point but I had suspicions about some things because his ex would text me and then I was like well he's like oh she's lying and all this and I believed him stupid me (laughs) um but 
that's just how it is. Like I, I have trust in people. Like I'm a kind hearted person and I will give you a thousand chances <laughs> and, and people take advantage of that. Mm-hmm. But, um, I was, I started using heavy again and I started to, what, what lose. year, what year was this now? What, what, what year are we talking here? Um, in 2021 to 2022. Okay. So on up until last year. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, I was, I started using again, I think in October of 2021. Mm-hmm. I quit my job in January, I think of, um, 2022. Yeah. And so during that time, drugs had taken away any ability you had to support yourself. Yeah. From a, from a job perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I pretty much relied on him. Mm hmm. And then, um, and that is the hardest thing when you are completely beholden to someone else for support. Yeah. I pretty much had my car mm-hmm. and the belongings that I could fit in my car. And then if he were there, like, cause he was there at that point, had his RV and him. And then was there ever a point when you looked at your life and said, Cassie, how did you get here? Um, yeah, sometimes towards the end <laughs> for sure. Okay. Because, um, we were together for a couple months, um, and then we started fighting really bad. And he was a big manipulator, and he was um, he had a way with his words, the way he talked to you, and the way he was so convincing about things. So I had to trust and believe him. Even though in the back of my mind, I'm like, this doesn't sound right. Mm-hmm. Um, well, but what could you do? Exactly. You were, like, you were, you were trapped. I mean, there yeah. wasn't any place where you could go anywhere. Yeah. I mean, if I really wanted to, I could have called my grandparents and been like, hey, I need to come live with you. But then. Is this the point when your pride gets in the way? <laughs> yeah. And then mm-hmm. also, if I leave this situation, then I won't have these drugs anymore. Mm-hmm. If I leave this person. I won't have this life anymore. And I mean, really, what life was it? But I liked this person and even more, I liked the drugs. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was rough. Now I knew in the back of my mind that I could, if I wanted to, but deep down, I didn't really want to. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's crazy because even though it isn't much of a life, the drugs on him was a life. It took it took over everything. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So, you know, we were we couldn't stay at his RV no more because it was on somebody's property. We couldn't move it. Um so we resorted to my car. And then we were driving around in my car, getting high, going to people's houses that we knew, you know, that we would hang out with. And then um After that, like, we we found a place that we could stay. Well, then we couldn't stay stay there no more. So then we was back to my car. And then um, my dad had moved out of the house. Him and my mom split up um, while I was with the last boyfriend. Well, um, my dad left the house, and it was just my mom and my brother there. And we need a place to go. So my dad said, if you go there, help your mom, whatever with the bills, you can go there and stay. And so we moved there. Then my dad sold the house like a couple months later. And um, then we up and had to leave again. So we were going to be homeless, um, living in my car. But we got a hold of one of his other friends and he wasn't, he didn't have anything to do with drugs. He drank and that's it. 
And he said, if you live here, like, I don't want any drugs in my house. I don't want that around or anything. And, you know, we're like, okay, obviously we're using, we're not going to just stop like that. So we had to sneak around about it and everything. Now, this whole time, through this whole period of losing places to live and living in my car and all this, he got very mean and manipulative. And when I would call him out on his bull grip, he would get violent. Mm -hmm. And he started to destroy my things. He would take um, he would take my stuff from me because he knew that that was something that I liked and I wanted. Um, he would destroy my car if I wouldn't listen to him. So not only are you an addict at this time, but you're also a domestic abuse abuse victim. Yes. And um, we, if we were in the car, like he would always want to take my car to go do whatever he was doing, which was being with other girls. And I'm like, you're not going to use my car for something that I don't want you to do because I thought that I love him. I loved him and like I was in love with him and I just wanted him to be my boyfriend, but he just wanted to go be this drug addict with these other, I don't know if you can say this on radio. Nope. Don't say it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) Uh, We don't, we'll leave that to the imagination. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So, um, and if I wouldn't let him take my, take my car, um, he would destroy it. He, um, one point, um, we were in a fight at his mom's house and he tried to get me to leave, but he had my, it was in the middle of winter. He had my shoes. He locked me out of the house. I didn't have my phone or my shoes or anything. And he wanted me to leave. And I'm like, I'm not going anywhere. So he comes outside and rips my rear view or the side mirror off the driver's side. And, um, throws my phone out the upstairs window. I think it's my phone, but he just threw my phone case out the window. I later found out it was just my phone case. To, but to make me think that he was destroying my stuff. There's a lot of emotional manipulation going on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, this was all because I found out that he was like cheating on me. Now, we had said that we were going to be... We weren't technically in a relationship, but we weren't talking to other people and we weren't doing other things with other people. In your mind, it was was exclusive. Yeah. And that's what we had discussed. And he had agreed to that. So when I find out these other things, especially leaving me at your grandma's house or your mom's house or whatever, for the very first time that I've ever been there to leave and go pay somebody to, you know... Mm-hmm. just use your imagination and then come back and like want to sleep in the same bed with me. And I'm like, he came back and I thought like he, he left and I thought he took my car keys with him cause he used somebody else's car mm-hmm. and he like hid my car keys from me. So I couldn't leave. I finally found them and I went to the gas station that he was at. He wasn't there. And finally he comes back. I'm like, you know, where you been? He's like, Oh, I had a flat tire and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay. Well, your phone says different. <laughs> and then that's when it all started when he was being violent to me, he threw me outside and all that. Well then after that, another time that he was like that to me, he wanted to leave early in the morning said he was going to work, but really he went and met up with this girl Um, I found out later, but because I wouldn't let him take my car, he punched my steering wheel. So like the emblem thing was like indented in it. Um, he punched out my radio. So my radio didn't work no more. He ripped my rear view mirror off. Um, he, um, punched me like in my leg, everything. Cause I was in the passenger seat. Um, and he was just being very violent towards me. I, he was driving down the road. I got out of the car with my stuff in my pockets and everything. I lost my phone that day because I, it was rainy. It was dark. And I was just trying to get away from him because that's the most abuse that I've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. 
And I didn't know what to do but to get out and run away. So you got out of the car. Yeah, and then he's like, please get back in the car, and he's chasing me down the road. I lost his cigarettes that I had in my pocket. I lost my phone. Um, He broke the glass piece also, so I was also pissed about that. (laughs) I was like... um, And then... I finally got back in the car. He's like, okay, like tried to sweet talk me, tried to say sorry or everything. So then he took my car and I stayed home and I got bruises on my legs and on my arms and everything. And then he calls me from work and asks if I'm okay. And I'm like, what do you think? (laughs) Yeah. Like the manipulation and like just the, I don't even know what to call it. It's just. So how were you able to get away from all that? Um, Tell me, tell me how you escaped that. Um, I, I left. Okay. There's this one situation where, um, I actually thought he was going to kill me. Um, now I have always felt safe with him because even though he would hurt me, he wouldn't let anybody else hurt me. And I knew that for a fact. Like, um, if we were around other dangerous people or, like, he thought they might be dangerous, you know, because being involved in drugs and money and all that, it's dangerous sometimes because people can get crazy. And I always felt like he would protect me against other people, even though he did that stuff to me. Well, this one time... We were driving down the road, and he pulled a knife out and hovered over me, and um, we were, he drove me to a cornfield, and he stopped, and he stabbed my car door. And then he made, it, he made a phone call, made it sound like he made a phone call, and then he drove um, to a cemetery, and at the cemetery, he made it seem like I was going to get out, and he was bringing me to somebody so they could finish the job. So at that point, I couldn't trust him not to hurt me, and I couldn't trust him not to let anybody else hurt me. Can I, and I need to interject here that, that this young lady is 24 years old. Okay, you're 24 now. Yeah. <laughs> this is all stuff that you have gone through just in the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. I mean, yeah. wow. It was crazy. Yeah. There, there's a lot more, too. There's like, there's tons of things and we don't have to get into huge specifics right (laughs) about those kinds of things that the that you know the main reason why i wanted to have you in here is to kind of talk about what you've been through and the fact that you've survived yeah so so you got so so um getting away from this abusive situation how did Mm -hmm. that how did that come about um well see i i didn't trust him no more so Mm -hmm. At that point, I was always skittish. I was always scared. Like, I didn't trust the people that we were hanging out with in the house that we were staying at either. So then um, I left because I had to go. I had to go see my probation officer, and I had a drug test. And I failed that, obviously. I thought I was going back to jail, but I didn't. Um, but my husband, actually, he got out of, jail, or he got out of prison from his sentence, from when we got in trouble in 2018. Mm -hmm. He is just getting out of prison in September of last... 2021, was it? It might be, because, you know, we're only two months into 2023. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, and he's just getting out. He... um, I have his wallet and I have his phone, so we have to meet up so I can give him his stuff. And we're talking, and I've talked to him a few times while he was in prison and stuff. Well, um, I told him what was happening, and he let me stay with him. I wasn't supposed to stay with him because he was living in a um, a motel that the state pays for. Mm -hmm. Um, And he would sneak me in because if he didn't, then I'd be sleeping on a park bench. And... um, I didn't have any clothes or anything. I just left everything because I was scared that I was going to die. I left my car. I left my clothes. The only thing I had was, like, my phone and a few clothing items that I left at a friend's house. I went back and got them. 
And um, I wore his clothes for like the first week. He finally came and dropped some stuff off to me. Was supposed to drop my car off, but didn't. I had to go back and get that um, once I had two people that could help me go get it and I could figure out where he was. Because mm-hmm. it was in my name, so there's nothing he could do. Mm-hmm. But he tried to keep it from me anyways. Um, yeah, so it's pretty much my husband helped me get out of it. Otherwise, I would have had no choice but to stay there. Mm -hmm. Um, And I quit drugs, like cold turkey. I When I went and got my car, actually, there was some in one of the bags in there that he left. And I was only clean for a week. And I tell you, one of the hardest things I've ever had to do was take that baggie and give it to somebody else and not touch it. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. Being a week clean. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that was hard, and I just, I watched him dispose of it, and I'm like, in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, no. And then, but, like, also, the can other you, side, I'm like. Can you point at that day as the difference maker in your life, maybe? Um, yeah, and then uh, that, and then my husband, um, after being back together for a couple weeks, I found out that I was pregnant. So um that, that makes me emotional. <laughs> yeah. So tell me, tell me now. So you're you're married to Dennis. Mm-hmm. You 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 ha- and I've watched you on Facebook become a mama bear. I have watched you. I mean, you are like you want to be the protector of this young man and see to it that he never has to go through anything like you have gone through. That's how yeah. I read it. Am I am I reading it right? Yeah, and I want to make sure that I'm able to raise <clears throat> my son to not be around drugs. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to be that mom that I've seen so many other people be to their kids as that drug mom or that mom that doesn't take care of their kids, doesn't bathe them when they're supposed to, doesn't feed them properly doesn't take care of them because they're more worried about getting high. Mm -hmm. And I don't ever want to be that type of mom. When you became, on the day when you became a mom, did you come to the realization that you're living for somebody else now, not yourself? Yeah. Okay. Um, Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely like a big change in your life. Like once you have a kid, especially if you want to be, that baby's like everything because mm-hmm. there's some people out there that just seem to care more about drugs than their kids. Mm-hmm. And, um, I always told myself I'm never going to be that person. So like on the day that he was born, I and knew he's how old now? Um, eight months, eight months old. Okay. Yep. And, um, and he is the most adorable <laughs> redheaded brown-eyed child I think I've ever seen. Yes. Yeah. He's so cute. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, um like and it's it's true when people say like once you become a mom then everything else is like second. Mhm. Um and like people have wanted me to like come over or wanted to see the baby or something and I'm like, well, you know, I do, but he's sleeping or he's not feeling it today he's cranky he's tired um and people just have to deal with that because Mm -hmm. whatever he needs is what i'm going to do first Mm -hmm. then whatever i want to do or whatever somebody else wants to do even if it does involve my child then it's still so i'm going to ask you a really really this might be a hard question you're 24 now. Mm-hmm. Um, you spent two years in my classroom. You were 16, 17. Mm-hmm. So what would the 24-year-old mother, Cassie, say to the 17-year-old student who was in my classroom? Oh, that is kind of a hard question. Yeah. Um, one thing I would say is um, always trust your gut. Mm-hmm. And trust your first instinct because there's a lot of things that happened after I left and being all the in all the situations that I've been in. Like my first my first instinct about it 
about certain things, I'm like, that's probably not right. But then I'm like, oh, no, it's fine. You know. Um, And probably, like, life isn't as hard as, it's not as rough as it may seem. Like, it's always going to get better, no matter what. Like, in high school, I was on and off depressed and, like, didn't didn't want to live and and I remember that and, we had we had got you and I had conversations in the hallway and I, I was like kiddo you you don't know yeah. how good you are you don't yeah. know and and that's how do you how do you see that as truth at 17 exactly and I'll tell you what like being 17 and in school and the things I think thought that were horrible then, like... Or important then. Yeah, is not even... It, it's not even matter now. Mm-hmm. Like, it doesn't even matter now. Yeah. And, like, your first... The first boyfriend that you have, like, it's probably not going to last. Like, I mean, there is some people out there that it has, but it it's okay if you break up. Like, it's not the end of the world. Work on yourself and... Mm-hmm work on finding the person that you want to be instead of um like wanting everything to do with them Mm -hmm. because that's one of the reasons why i don't have many friends because when i was in that first relationship i was we were so stuck on each other like we didn't want to hang out with anybody else and then that's one of the reasons why we broke up is because he kind of started to want different things your your bubble your bubble was too small you yeah needed, your bubble needed to be bigger yeah yeah and you know but. so congratulations for surviving kiddo. <laughs> thanks I'm, I'm i am so happy that you and i are able to sit here and talk about this and you're able to share your story with everyone and really i mean everything that you've shared in the last 50 minutes here could theoretically happen To someone's daughter, someone's son, right? Exactly, because I never thought that would happen to me. Mm -hmm. I never thought that I would even try drugs. I never thought that I would even come in contact with the police. I Spend time in jail. Yeah, I never thought any of that could happen. I never thought that at some point in my life I could be looking at prison time. Well, Thankfully, I didn't. And, but. And, and, and the Cassie that I knew in digital media production was someone I never saw um, going in that direction either. And from the day that I saw you in that mug shot uh, when I was working at 9 and 10, um, the fact that you're here to tell your story, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So what's next for you? Everything. So if, if everything in life works out exactly the way you want it to be, where is Cassie Faust in five years? Um, well, I I was thinking about I don't know what I don't know for sure, but I was thinking about um, trying to go back to school. Mm-hmm. I don't know for what yet, um, but yeah, that and just being happy with my husband and our son. Finding a job and showing up on time every day. <laughs> yeah. <Someday. laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I, I'm a late person, though. I'm always late. All right. Like, yeah, I know. If I, <laughs> I, I totally get it. I totally yeah. get it. You, you sleep too long. Mm-hmm. You, you wait. You wait until too late to start getting ready. It just happens. Especially with the baby, it's so hard. <laughs> uh, you will. M- m- new moms are never on time. Ever. <laughs> yeah. Ever. Mm-hmm. You know. I mean, if you're if you're uh, setting a time for for mm-hmm. you and Dennis to be somewhere, it needs to be a half hour before you actually have to be there. Yeah. 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 See, like if the bus wasn't bringing me to your class, I probably would have been late for that too. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's to. Uh, Here's to great things for you in the future. I am very proud of you. You have overcome a lot, a lot of things that um, weren't your to some things that were your decision, some things that just happened to you through uh, through no fault of your own. But uh, Cassie Faust has been our guest. Cassie, thank you for trusting me enough to to answer these questions and to talk about your life. and And I love you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, of course. I I've been wanting to do this for a long time, and I'm. We- 
We've Glad been ta- we finally did We've it. We've been talking about it for <laughs> yes. a while. All right. Yes. Cassie Faust, our guest on Cadillac Unscripted on 107.9 CDY. Join us next week. Same time, same station for more local chat sponsored by Independent Bank on CDY.